afternoon. Welcome to UK Column News. It is the 19th of March 2015 and it's just gone one o'clock. Myself, Louise Collins, Brian Gerrish and Nick are here in Plymouth. And we have got Mike West joining us from Bastion Radio and he'll be joining in throughout the show. Spring's here. Spring is here. So it's pretty sunny. It's sunny in the northwest. It's sunny in Penzance. It's sunny in Plymouth. It's sunny in Manchester. It's a bit grey in London, but that's mainly coming from the Tory party and the uh, budget, uh, which I have to say Mike Robinson will be looking at in detail tomorrow. Um, well, what better place to start than somebody who needs help? So we're just going to remind people that uh, Chris Spivy, uh, who has been uh, very hard working in pushing out um, information, uh, particularly about the Lee Rigby murder, um, is in court tomorrow. He's trying to protect his family because the state wants him silenced and uh, they've decided the way to uh, silence him is to come after his grandchild. So um, this is the reality of David Cameron's Conservative Britain in 2015. If you dare to challenge the state or question any of the state released information, uh, they come for your children. Exactly, yeah. So that's at two o'clock South End Magistrates Court um, tomorrow. So um, I know there are quite a few people are going down there to support, but the more people there to support Chris would be very much received and great, grateful. Yeah. OK, well, um, some interesting um, events in America, and that is that the fingers now firmly being pushed at, uh, pointed towards uh, George W. Bush over uh, affairs for the wars and uh, we just have a look at veterans today here that have uh, flagged up uh, the release of a book um, Bugliozzi presents a case against George W uh, Bush for mass murder and this is the uh, publication that they're talking about uh, it says the book is meticulously researched and clearly presented legal case that puts George W Bush on trial for murder after he leaves his pre presidency, a searing indictment of the president and his administration. Uh, he's talking, of course, about the war in Iraq uh, carried out under false pretenses that caused great loss of life, cost the American nation close to one trillion dollars and alienated most of our allies in the Western world. So uh, we think this is very good to see that uh, people are not forgetting um, the names of the people that have created these unlawful wars overseas. And of course, many people in Britain pointing the finger at uh, Tony Blair. Mm. And of course, we're still waiting for the famous report into uh, the Iraq war to emerge. But that's uh, being held, I would guess, until after the election yeah, when so. uh, they'll end, try and bury it. End of May, I do believe it's due out. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Now, if you're speaking out against the government, you can expect uh, to have government agencies listening in on uh, what's being said. Yeah, well, they finally actually come clean. Interesting that it's only coming out on Russia today. Uh, I haven't seen it anywhere else. But the government's finally come clean on using far-reaching hacking powers to get access to computers, phones and other communication networks anywhere in the world. And uh, it came to light after Privacy International filed a legal challenge questioning hacking powers of GCHQ, all on the back of Edward Snowden's um, revelations. But um, Private in Privacy International decided to go public with their findings and um, the government's had to come, come clean and admit it. So it's definitely worth going and having a little look at um, over on RT and uh, reading that article. Would this be a good opportunity to bring in some comment from so. Bastion Radio? Yes, Bastion. Hi, Mike. We can't hear you. There we are. Hello. Hi, yes. Mike. That's better. Uh, hi, guys. How are you? Uh, we, we are fine. Thank you very much for joining us on the uh, on the uh, news today. We th we thought the subject of GCHQ spying on people would be a good opportunity to bring you in because. Yeah, you've taken the bold step to set up your own broadcast. Tell us why you've done that and uh, how you're finding things. Oh, no doubt they're listening to, um, to us all, Brian, and they have been doing for a long time. I don't think this is nothing new at all. Um, Bastion Radio, that, that, that's quite new. We've only been around for about two months now. We've still got the L plates on, so we're still finding our feet, as it were. But I've got no problem at all, GCHQ, listening in, because I'll tell you something, Brian. I want them to know what our opinions are. I want them to know how we feel. People are getting angry, but we've got to look at this 
you know, I, I take the same line that you guys do. This can't be dealt with violence. We're not, we're, we don't stand for violence at all. We need to tackle this in a lawful way. And I think this is what scares them. This is why they're monitoring. This is why they're going for this legislation um, that enables them to listen to us in multiple ways. And um, I, I think it's them that's scared. I'm not scared. No, because fear, you're, you, you're, you're feeding it, aren't you? You're you showing your fear that they've got you. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think, you know, with people operating together, um, this scares them more. Um, what, what actually scares them is people grouping together, um, sharing the same opinions and wanting to know answers to the same questions. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I'd, I'd, I'd add to that that many years ago, um, when I was just starting to realise that something wasn't right, uh, I was researching and digging and talking to people, but I eventually came across uh, a wonderful gentleman called Ted, Ted Hamlin. He'd actually been campaigning for many years uh, for reform of the banks and, uh, and to introduce uh, currency as credit instead of debt. Um, but he was teasing me on one occasion and he said, the thing to remember, Brian, is these people are all frightened. And I said, well, what are they frightened of? And he, he said, come on, you must know. And I said, well, I don't. And so I had to push him a bit. And then he said, well, it's easy. It doesn't matter whether they're Tony Blair or the president of the United States. What they're all terrified of is the truth and exposure. And yeah. that was a lesson that I never forgot. And I think it's absolutely true today that simply by putting out the truth, showing that uh, the general public does know what's going on, that is a terrifying thing for for all of our politicians and, and the hidden power in the establishment. What what sort of support have you been getting since you've been doing your broadcast? Are you, are you picking people up and are they... Um, are they coming in with emails saying, well done? Yeah, I, we've had very good feedback. Um, you know, the numbers are, are slowly rising. We didn't expect anything massive. We don't expect Radio 4 or Radio 1 figures by any means. You know, every, by each of us doing our own thing, you know, it, it takes time. Um, and we are in it for the long term. We don't want to be a flash in the pan. This isn't something that I just thought of because all of a sudden I felt angry about the situation one day. This has been building up for years um, Brian and you know I, I, I'd taken to Twitter uh, taken to emailing people um, but I got to the stage where I thought it's not enough it's not enough You've, we've, we've got to start doing things together sharing opinions um, seeking solutions to these problems and um, yeah and the uh, Bastion Radio was the next step but we, we're, we're not here to work in opposition against other alternative media I think the whole idea is is to share our resources work towards the same goal and that that's that's very much where we're heading but in response in the last few weeks we've, we've been very surprised very surprised pleasantly surprised well that's good and yeah. i'll just we did mention it yesterday but we think the the fact that uh, panorama is now backing down from its uh, explosive investigation yeah. documentary into alternative media and these nasty people talking about child abuse I, I think this is quite significant yeah. and it tells me that uh, the BBC's, um, well, it was BBC was initially going for blood and now suddenly they're thinking... Mm, There's, a pattern. There's a pattern to that, Brian, isn't there? You've already had yeah. um, experience with the BBC backing down and that was when you phoned Radio 4 um, with regards to the Oxford and Sherwell Valley case. So this isn't the first time. I mean, in actual fact, if the BBC contacted us, I'd, I'd welcome them with open, open arms. Um, I can't see what we've got to run away from. We've, we've got nothing to hide. The people that are doing the running, as we've discussed, seems to be them. Uh, that's, that's absolutely true. Well, on the subject of the BBC, we just move on to this uh, um, next report. And uh, here's the BBC crowing that uh, Britain's now put military trainers in to assist the Ukrainian military. Um, of course, the um, the story is, well, we're only sending things like first aid kits and <laughs> sleeping bags and yeah. night vision goggles. Um, so um, we've got here BBC correspondent Tom Burridge said the deployment of dozens of military instructors was a symbolic move that would not alter the military balance of the war. Well, that's got to be a lie because, of course, you don't send military advisers uh, to do nothing. You send them to do something. And of course, what they're doing is now bringing Britain's uh, military capability onto Russia's doorstep. 
And what I find amazing, of course, is this is being done as Cameron gets ready to chop another 15%. That's what we're being told, 15% from our defence budget. Uh, we're looking to take the British Army down to a level of about 50,000. Uh, that's unviable. Uh, we're not here debating whether we should have an army for wars overseas. What we're talking about is... Uh, the fact we're seeing pure lies coming out of the Conservative administration. We need defence. Putin's a threat. But what do they do with the other hand? They cut the military to the bone. And bef before I give you opportunity to just respond on that, if you can pop that back on screen, Nick, if we... There we go. Uh, we just wanted to bring in this, that um, we say to our viewers and listeners, if you still haven't read the article uh, on UK column, BBC Media Action Subversion from Broadcasting House to Kazakhstan, encourage you to read it, a BBC charity boasting about the ability to get in and destabilise countries. Syria is mentioned in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, so they get in, they help the destabilisation, and then they cruise off the news reporting of the bloodshed. Uh, how, do, how do you feel about Ukraine at the moment, Mike? Well, if I, if I can just draw a parallel, Brian, I may, some people might not agree with me here, but I think it's the same when you're in, in a battle with anyone. <clears throat> and I'll try and put it into Civvy Street um, scenario. Um, your favourite people, Common Purpose, um, they've infiltrated most, if not all, of our public services over the last 15 to 20 years, um, more so in the last decade. Um, if you're at war with someone, and this government it's quite clearly at war with its own people to take what it can. You infiltrate and you put these um, people into agitate services to break things down. I think we're seeing exactly the same thing with um, Ukraine at this very moment. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if these so-called specialist people from the military are common purpose trained, because common purpose are all over the military. They're all over our police, they're all over our public services, everything that affects us. So... I wouldn't be surprised at all, Brian, um, if these, uh, if Common Purpose has a hand in this. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be surprised at all. We're getting some amazing reports in at the moment from uh, things going on in the military. And uh, one of the things being reported is a massive increase in bullying. So people talking, particularly in the Royal Navy, about a culture change. Um, my experience of life at sea was ships were very quiet, calm, friendly places, and people got on and did their jobs, and it was all very relaxed. Uh, but we're getting some uh, really extraordinary reports about very aggressive bullying, mm. and this has come from somewhere. But uh, the BBC, I think, um, while it was promoting uh, the British military over Ukraine, is now having a go at stabbing them in the back. Oh, that's your thoughts. I actually found this story for you. I thought maybe you could do some catwalk modelling for us. Okay. Royal Navy's got a new <laughs> uniform in the first 70 years it's been unveiled. Um, it's uh, the previous light blue shirt and trousers, known as action working dress, or number fours, have been worn at sea ever since World War II. And the Navy has described the new darker blue version as more modern, comfortable and fire retardant. What are your thoughts on it, Brian? I, I think... Um this is just incredible. We've got the armed forces cut to the bone. We've got the situation where we can't really run our nuclear submarines. We've got aircraft carriers being built, but there's no aircraft for them to go on. Um, we've got huge problems. We've got no Nimrod reconnaissance no. aircraft. Um, what is the promotion that we've got a new uniform? And I've got a I Let's put it back up. You. Let's see what everyone see, sees the new. Well, the first thing I can say to our audience that the BBC saying it's the first. Um, uh, change in 70 years is complete and utter nonsense. I don't know where they, where they got that from. Uh, but I think these images of two particularly scruffy uh, ratings, what is this designed to do? I think this is Mickey taking of Britain's military. And have we really got money to spend on changing the uniform when we haven't got military exactly. equipment in yep. the field? Exactly. But I, I take your joke. I'll speak to you afterward about that. Um, OK, well, where do we go? Let's uh, get down to reality. And of course, um, Melanie Shaw is still sat in a prison cell in Sodexo profit making prison in uh, Peterborough. Uh, what's her crime? Simply um, whistleblowing on child abuse, her own and that of up to 150 other youngsters at Beechwood. Uh, so let's remind ourselves of the situation around Nottingham. 
um, and her court case. Uh, so we've seen a succession of um, trumped up charges uh, in order to um, keep Melanie Shaw through going through the courts and in prison. And the one we have um, been focusing on is two counts of harassment against persons unknown. So we don't know who the victim is because they're unknown, no witnesses to unknown victims. So what was the result? The charge is thrown out, but Melanie Shaw is still sitting in a police cell. Well, contrast that to the Nottingham re Post report on this gentleman, uh, because they've printed a really positive story. I think it, it could have, um, you know, it could be part of electioneering, really, because here he is, Ken Clark, the man who's done so much for Britain. And let's have a look what the article says. Um, Mr. Clark um, uh, said that he'd been pestered by this man. He's talking about Ben Fellows uh, with his hoax claim for some years. The Crown Prosecution Service has now decided to prosecute him. And I have agreed to give evidence as a prosecution witness if required. I do not know the man as far as I'm aware. I have never met him. And that is the bulk of the article. So essentially the Nottingham Post not putting in any other information, no interviews with Ben Fellows, no looking at the fact the police are on record on the internet of saying that certain people uh, in the establishment and government are above the law. The Nottingham Post simply gives uh, a glowing report on Mr Ken Clark. Do they mention the date of the court? Uh, no, there's. Uh, I don't think so. I All can't. Right. Okay. can't I can't remember on that one. I'm afraid. Um, but it gets better because uh, here we have the Nottingham Post, and they're now saying that um, this highly experienced politician Ken Clark is is rather bewildered by the Brit British Bill of Rights, and um, he says that I find scrapping the Human Rights Act rather bewildering. We are promised a drafted bill in due course, which I hope will address this in slightly more detail and correct any misapprehensions I've got. I often, even as minister, lost judicial review cases where I was rather annoyed of the judgment of the court, but I'd never proposed to sweep away the whole jurisdiction on that basis. This is the same Kenneth Clark who's been repeatedly calling for more star yeah. chambers, secret courts. Hey, look, the picture there is... Um he looks a, a lot younger than what he did before. Maybe they're, they're, they're flattering him a little bit. Well, but if he if he doesn't understand this and he's bewildered by this, how the hell does he? Well, does he remember? Me? He says he claims he doesn't know and hasn't met Ben Fellows. Well, Was he a bit bewildered at the time? Maybe could have been bewildered. But if you think that um, Nottingham Post is um, is being fair in their promotion, well, uh, we've got another article from the Nottingham Post. And uh, Rushcliffe MP Kenneth Clark calls for Tories to loosen dependence on millionaires and party donations should be capped. To which we say, does loosen dependence on millionaires mean make the process looser and less transparent? So we thought our viewers would like to, <coughs> excuse me, meet a typical Tory donor. And uh, here we are, David Cameron's billionaire backer who was quizzed in court as part of a divorce battle uh, some time ago. This is back in 2013. And the man is uh, Poggio Zabludovitz, a Finnish Israeli former arms dealer. And of course, this was, uh, this was the man who donated 15,000 pounds to David Cameron's personal leader of the Tory party campaign. Uh, but Mr. Zabludovitz also gave 131,805 to the uh, Tory party as a whole. And uh, while he was doing that, his wife, who we can bring in here, um, was not only donating money, but um, she was also running an art gallery with statues of erections, including one of Jesus Christ with an erection. So um, Mr. Clark, well, I think we're fully aware of the type of people supporting uh, conservatives and uh, it almost beggars belief. Any, any comments from Bastion Radio on that one? <laughs> Just confirms to me, Brian, what David Cameron really meant when he said we're all in it together. Um, yeah, it's just a, a quagmire of arms companies, banks, insurance companies, basically the city of London. Um, and it's just, it's just in our faces, Brian. I, as for Kenneth Clark, 
in the Ben Fellows situation, it's deny, deny, deny. This is the guy that turned around and said that the paedophile stories and scandals that are coming out now, which are silly stories from the 1980s. How can we trust his opinion? Well, exactly. I totally agree with you on that. And I'm pleased to see that you're also a little bit lost for words. Some of this stuff <laughs> is becoming so obvious that you almost don't know what to say. Brian, sometimes, even during the radio show, when um, um, we discuss things between each other that may have not been brought in on script, you do, so, I mean, when you come on on Friday, uh, sorry, on Sunday, um, there are things you literally get stuck for words. You just do not know what to say. The brain can't cope with what's going on. It's, it's scary. Yeah. And somebody's just kindly told us that uh, the Ben Fe Ben Fellows will be in the Old Bailey uh, Friday the 20th. Tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Now, I wasn't aware of that, so thank mm. you very much for telling us. I don't know what that would be for. Probably a directions hearing, I think, because... Yeah. Well, I'll give him a call tonight and then let you know for tomorrow morning and then you can let people know. But I know if people are in London um, and if you can't get to Chris Bivy down at South End um, and you can get to the Old Bailey to see Ben, um, well, please get there and uh, Brian will bring you some more tomorrow and I'll get in touch with Ben tonight. Okay. okay. Well, back to Mr Cameron. Mm. Happy days for synagogues and Jewish schools. George Osborne has given them a £10 million a year for security against anti-Semitic attacks. Last night, David Cameron spoke to Jewish leaders and vowed not to turn a blind eye to non-violent extremism and attacks and that new money had been found in the budget for, to protect them against a Paris or Denmark-style attacks. He then dropped a classic remark. Uh, the idea that Muslims all over the world are being persecuted as a deliberate act of Western policy, that 9-11 and 7-7 attacks was a Jewish plot, all was staged events, all nonsense. Um, at the moment, £2 billion a year is provided in security to Jew Jewish state schools. Um, and really, where's all this, this money could be going, rather than giving it to synagogues, could be helping maybe people who are going to go to food banks and well, the homeless and the pensioners who can't afford their heating, maybe some of it. It's, it's a very interesting situation where the government's take, now taking steps to particularly um, help one sector of yeah. society in this way. And I think it raises a number of questions and it'll be interesting to see what sort of feedback we get from having reported this because generally um, this raises huge emotions. We're simply being cold and saying, just how is it that uh, we can have um, a sum of 10 million suddenly donated to one particular section of society when other members of societies don't seem to get any attention from the government at all. Mm. Uh, well, David Cameron. David Cameron. Uh, University of Birmingham, um, a doctor there, Dr Simon Pemberton, has upset a few people by saying that Britain's political policies have turned us into one of the world's most harmful to its citizens. Dr Pembleton said every year thousands of adults and children die or are injured as a result of preventable events. Um, here are some figures. 18,000 die because of winter. 29,000 die early from air pollution. 13,000 die from cancers contracted within the workplace. And uh, all this research has been done by Dr. Pemberton. And he's basically blaming our government for the unpreventable, the preventable deaths that occur in this country. So if we follow things through, as it was in the lead up to this very dubious election, we've got massive attack on all, all areas of society. So the government is saying, well, of course, the whole problem with the paedophile issue is the police didn't do their job. Theresa May saying that um, police need to be charged. Uh, we've got the military, total neglect and rundown of the military. Uh, we've got education uh, cuts yep. and changes, the sexualisation of children. The NHS, of course, is being sold off and privatised, complete lie by David Cameron's government. So we're, we're seeing a, a rising chaos. Yep. And then this article is saying, well, British society, awful. This is deliberate, or Absolutely. orchestrated stuff. Uh, Mike, over to you. Well, Brian, I, I, I totally agree. And I think it's going to really get interesting because what normally happens is, is when things start getting exposed is um, they all turn on each other. So I don't think they have to rely on us on having a massive uprising, standing up there with pitchforks. I think they're going to all start turning on, on each other. And uh, that's when we're really going to see the establishment start to collapse down. Um, but David Cameron, 
uh, his, his, his ideas there on security for the Jewish community, I mean, you know, it just shows you friends in good places. He's, um, he's uh, well in with the friends of Israel. Um, and this is the sort of thing that's happening. He's making them as if they're going to be the targets. I ask the question is, is with our defences down at this very moment, um, a Navy, like you say, with aircraft carriers, no aircraft to fit them down, our army being shrunk at a time that we're facing possibly a World War Three attack, where's our protection? I couldn't say it better. And the answer to that is to neglect the defences of a, of a country, of a nation, is treason. Uh, well, north of the border, things um, uh, go from bad to worse. And of course, one of the topics that we've covered now over several weeks is the danger of um, the single police force in Scotland, Police Scotland, under Sir Stephen House. And uh, the Daily Record in Scotland um, has been focusing on a video clip that's been up for a little while, uh, but they finally, I think, started to understand the significance of it and the fact that um, several, I think it's now in the hundreds of thousands of people have looked at this clip. So this is obviously just a still, but essentially the police uh, stop a man driving a van they start to ask him questions. He responds in a very measured way, including saying, you know, what law have I broken? Uh, the police get very aggressive because he's um, he's basically not... Um, uh, um, not obeying. He's not obeying. That's the right word, Louise. He's not obeying them. Um, so he continues to challenge them. What right have they got to do what they're doing? What law has he breached? Um, does he have the right to remain silent? And then the next minute is that the uh, police simply smash in through the side window, which we can see in the picture here, uh, take his ignition key, unlock the door, and the man is then dragged out and into custody. So uh, at no stage do the police accuse him directly of breaking the law. They don't say what law he's mm. broken. They don't arrest him in a formal way and uh, read his rights. He is, uh, they simply smash their way into the vehicle and then he's taken off. And um, we say that uh, if we're not careful, this is exactly what we're going to see happening south of the border. Of course, Scottish police also under pressure for the fact that they've been arming more and more officers on the beat and then lying to members of the Scottish Parliament and indeed the Scottish public about the use of those armed officers. Whereas south of the border... Um, Trouble at mill for um, Mr Hogan Howe. Yeah, definitely. MPs and victims are calling for the Met to hand over a paedophile ring probe after Hogan Howe became embroiled. Um, Hogan Howe was Assistant Chief Constable at Merseyside in 1998. And at that time, a Labour MP was um, being uncovered for being a paedophile. And Hogan Howe must have known about this investigation. So they are wanting uh, more investigations done by himself, but not to be investigated by police, that somebody independent should go and interview him. But he says here, quoted from the uh, Daily News, he does not recall details about the investigation or any suspects, um, to which uh, other people, including the Mirror, said it's inconceivable that Hogan Howe and his cohorts weren't aware of the accusations. Mm. So this is all in the past. I don't really remember. Maybe he's got a little bit of dementia. Ken, yeah, or a bit like Ken Clark. Can't remember. Can't remember. And um, the mirror here, uh, yeah, this, is, this is how they put it across, but with the headline, child abuse victims call for Met Police to hand over the paedophile ring probe. But um, Hogan Howe, upstanding police officer, we can trust him, says, I can't really remember. And I believe that the, sen lost the documents. senior police officer from Hillsborough was also saying there were two hours of the day at Hillsborough uh, when he finally admitted that was the police caused the problem by unlocking the gates. But similarly with the Hillsborough incident, the police saying, I can't actually remember what I did for two hours on the day of the uh, incident. Well, if we can't trust the police, um, perhaps we can trust Labour politicians. And here she is, a glowing report from the Daily Telegraph on Harriet Harman. And they've had a look behind the political mask. And uh, they've been asking Labour's deputy leader about the party women's rights and her love of kittens. Uh, well, we were interested in this because um, part of her report was that 
She says, actually, my cause is not to self-describe. My cause is to change the description that fits everybody else's lives when it's unfair and when people have to struggle and when they face prejudice, prejudice and discrimination. I'm not entirely sure what the language means because she's not saying she'll do anything about anything. She says she's going to change the description. Um, but The Telegraph doesn't remind its readers, of course, that... Um, Harriet Harman was involved with um, Liberty at a time when Liberty was uh, promoting two paedophile organisations, Paedophile Information Exchange and Paedophile Action for Liberty. Um, so we're going to remind people and we're going to say that this lady could possibly become Deputy Prime Minister. What was she doing in her background would appear to be helping to promote paedophiles. Um, she has done nothing to help real victims. Here's Melanie Shaw, but we could have Mickey Summers or we could have Holly Gregg, for example. And um, she's, uh, Harriet Harman's going to change descriptions, um, but she hasn't actually done anything to help any of the victims, whether they're female or not. Is she also the woman who said there's no proof that it, um, having sex with children actually harms them in later life? Was it her who said that? I don't believe it was, wasn't Louise. It? I with know there her, was a the, politician the, who said came out with that statement, wasn't there? Uh, well, the, I think that statement was linked to taking um, pornographic photographs it, of yes. children. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. according to uh, Miss Harmon, the onus should be on the parents to prove that the children That's had right. suffered yep. harm as Apologies. a result of the photographs being taken. Uh, but it's all pretty mucky stuff. Um, now... Probably a good time for Bastian Radio to come back in on that before we show a, a, a little communication we had to do with Melanie Shaw. Thanks for that picture, guys. Uh, that, that really has upset my lunch. <laughs> now, I, I can't find words to describe um, what I feel about Harriet Harman. Um, whilst taxpayers are still funding probably her husband's viewing of porno channels on the Virgin Media account that um, we were expensing not so long ago, um, is she talking about the prejudices, when she talks about prejudice, um, is she talking about paedophiles, um, that they haven't got the rights to have the age of consent lowered? This is the type of mindset that we're dealing when we're talking about people with Harriet Harman. You've just got to look into her background. Uh, I'll be quite honest, um, Brian, I'm going to tame it down here because she absolutely disgusts me. OK, yeah, I think I think I can agree with that sentiment. And it's it's basically it's the veneer of respectability. And then what what is actually delivered to the general public is um, is Quite some pretty different. dangerous um, new labor um, politics. And of course, we've uh, we've consistently seen the uh, the attacks on children, the sexualization of children. And I think the agenda to drastically lower the age of consent is still there, which is a yeah. measure which moves towards helping paedophiles. I don't know if I mentioned this. I heard from a source that they had a problem with their daughter at school and she went in and spoke to teachers and teachers said it's ridiculous that the age of consent hasn't been lowered. Yeah. And right. that's coming from teachers. Wouldn't yeah. surprise me at all. Now, I'm just going to pop this letter up on screen that was sent to us. Um, we very often receive communications from people um, with no identity. And I'm going to gently say, while we do thank people for taking the trouble to communicate with us, it's very frustrating if we can't, if we can't speak to the people who send the information. So I'll just read this. Dear Brian, just a note concerning Melanie Shaw. It seems that Miss Shaw needs better legal advice. I know a team called Public Interest Lawyers in Birmingham and they take on cases against the government so they won't be easily intimidated. I believe they will be intimidated. I believe they would be intimidated, sorry, interested in the way she's been treated by the law um, or the lack of it. Now, we just did a little bit of research into um, this law firm and here they are, Public Interest Lawyers. And we, we, don't, um, uh, we don't feel very comfortable with the fact that we've got a legal team openly um, declaring that they've got a political, a socialist political agenda. Uh, and we also uh, are slightly unsettled by the fact they're also uh, connected to the London School of Economics. So I'm just going to say thank you very much for sending in the letter. 
The key problem around Melanie Shaw is not legal teams, it's the fact that we are now witnessing the, the system of law in Britain has broken down. It's been subsumed for the use of criminals in order to uh, mm. further damage victims. And uh, if you have a court which is being run as a star chamber, there's no jury, so one judge is controlling the court. It actually doesn't matter what legal team you have in there. Um, the judge can simply direct proceedings as best suits him. So if the person who wrote the letter would like to get back into contact with us, we're very hope happy to have a discussion. But at the moment, uh, we're not minded to encourage Melanie Shaw in the direction of this legal team. And in any case, Melanie Shaw simply wishes to be represented by the lady who's kindly stepped forward to be a lay legal advisor to her. Um, but on the subject of justice in the courts, um, interesting news over the Hampstead case. Yep, Judge Justice Palfrey ruled this morning that the allegations from the two children in the Hampstead case were baseless and um, and uh, lurid allegations of most serious kind, but there were signs of significant paedophilia activity and that the children had been sexually abused. But as for uh, what the children were disclosing, um, it's baseless, according to Justice Portley. And of course, anybody who dares mention it, she describes as evil yeah. or foolish. So uh, I think the phrase is... Um, uh, the ordinary man on the Clapham omnibus, if they were to be shown a video of two young children, eight and nine years old, uh, de describing horrific sexual practices, abuse, and uh, describing intimate marks on the bodies of their abusers, tattoos, warts, and other uh, very intimate physical features. Um, you listen to the video of those two children speaking, and we've now got a single judge ruling a court, a secret court, saying, well, there's no evidence to this at all. And of course, you can see online the uh, video interviews of the police in which the police are, are not only stressing the children by keeping them up under constant interview till late in the evening, but they're clearly giving the children leading questions. Um, so something very, very sinister has gone on in Hampstead. Um, Judge Palfrey, uh, in our opinion, has been brought in to close things down. They had to admit the children have been abused because the medical reports are released on the internet describing uh, physical damage as a result of that abuse. Uh, but if any members of the public dare to express an opinion, uh, well, you are evil uh, or indeed foolish. Um, is there any way of the public or, or people finding out if the people, the children named, had been interviewed and inspected? Is there any way for people to find out that, that, that information? Uh, well, there is one way, and that is that um, the conclusions of the police investigation were released to the internet. Um, so you can read the last two pages of what was a 77-page report by the police on their action. Uh, but I find it very significant that despite all of the other documentation being released to the internet, including, of course, the police interviews yeah. with the children, the police report has not been released. And your question, of course, is extremely powerful because since the children were describing people's bodies in great detail, uh, the police only had to um, bring in, interview and examine two or three people and the case would have been proven in one go. Exactly. So I think we're seeing very serious things going on in the courts. Our view is another cover-up. Bastian, would you like to comment at all on this very disturbing subject? Yeah, there's, uh, there's developing on a daily basis this case. Um, it's only up till last night um, we're seeing information coming in that there could be some BBC connection with this, with some names being named. Um, I haven't fully looked into this because this is coming late last night, so I'll be looking at that today. Um, but nothing surprises me, and we see the same patterns. Um, I go back to a case that is quite on my doorstep, to be honest. Um, it's my son's school. 
Um, it got into the national press, the Hillside Primary School in Western Supermare a couple of years ago. I'm seeing exactly the same things happening in Hampstead, what happened with my son's school when that got, when the head teacher there got caught. Um, over four years, he committed 30 incidents that were proven um, against children in that school, um, 11 of which were reported to the local authority, which were not acted on. So here we have over a four-year period of teachers making the local authority aware and the, the headmaster of the school, the, the actual head, uh, and nothing was acted on. Now, like Nigel Leet is his name. I can name him now because he's serving 14 years in prison, which in my, which in my case is not long enough. Yeah. Um, luckily, my child had never been abused there. I was lucky he'd just started at the time that this all blew up. But I see the same thing, and I can see the same thing that's happened with that school in Hampstead and the church. They closed the school. They changed the name of it. So they've done the same thing at this school. They've closed the website. They've closed access to it. It's a complete shutdown. And the alarm bells are ringing with me, Brian, because of my personal experience of what happened to the school that my son goes to. And, um, uh, you know, those people that are, are putting this down as a hoax, whatever, just do some research, look into it. Don't put this down and poo-poo it. I think people are put off because the name Satanic has been brought into it. And um, this thing does go on. Yeah. If it doesn't go on, why have the Metropolitan Police got a Satanic abuse unit? Exactly. Okay. I mean, you know, what the, needs to happen for the, because it's causing divide within, you know, this kind of tr the truth movement. Yeah. As such, it's causing huge divide, um, which is it just mirrors the Holly Gregg case. Whereas if if we if if it can be put out that the people the children named had been interviewed, they had been inspected, and there were no identifiable marks, then this can be put to bed, and then it needs to go back down to find out who yeah. the abusers of those children were. Because you know if if these things have been put into their heads and this needs to be addressed as well, as well as the physical abuse that they've, they've got. So it's now being left up in the air is going to cause more divide, more arguments, more online spats, more hoax websites being um, created yeah. where it can be put to bed and it can be settled and dealt with. And then the, the welfare yeah. of those children, you know, and they may be hopefully one day be able to get their lives back on track. But while all this divide and while it's all this is going on and the police aren't letting mm. us know, then this is just going to carry on and on and on and on. Agreed. Which opinion. I think, Louise, is what the establishment wants. So we can bring in, uh, well, to finish off here, Theresa May, of course, who we all trust implicitly. Uh, don't worry because she's got it all under control because she's got her child abuse investigation panel running. Mm, well, she has. I've just answered one question. But Bill Maloney is working very hard on the sidelines, guys. Um, he's, he knows about the case and he's working in the background. And um, that's what I can tell you. That's what I know. OK, as for Theresa May and the child abuse inquiry, I need to say a massive thanks to Kaz and Strider, as well as um, a new person on Twitter I've come across, My Sweet Landlord. I'll give you his link incredible research so yesterday i mentioned that was it possible that this lady's first husband was connected to the establishment well people can go into the uk column forums and have a look at some of the work uh, strider and others have been doing on this but we can confirm um that she does have links her first husband was connected um to the royalty and the establishment and let's just remind ourselves of when the story broke about her being taken over as the new head. head. Uh, Mrs May has insisted she is confident that thorough checks have been carried out to ensure there are no conflicts of interest that could undermine her appointment. Labour MP Keith Vaz, uh, the committee chairman, asked Judge Goddard, would you regard yourself as being part of the establishment? Goddard replied, we don't have such a thing in my country and I did have to ask carefully what is meant by it so I did understand what I was being asked to discuss. Disclosed. My, disclosed. disclosed. Uh, my understanding is, do I have any links into any institution or any persons relevant to the subject matter of the inquiry? And no, I do not. Well, um, I think she's telling porkies. She was married to Sir John Scott, who was the fifth baronet of Beauclerk, is that? Uh, Bywell in St Andrews, Northumberland. And he was born in 1948. And um, 
he married Lowell Goddard in 1969 and they had one daughter born in 1970. The marriage later ended in divorce in 1977. So here, she, here we have Lowell Goddard as a young lady with a corgi on her lap and uh, there is her former husband, Sir Johnny Scott. But he's was, not establishment. He, he's Sir John Scott, the fifth baronet of Beauclerk. So he is establishment. He's also very good friends with uh, Clarissa Dixon, who was one of the two fat ladies. And this is from My Sweet Landlord's Twitter. He does incredible research. Um, in her book, Spilling the Beans, there is a paragraph where Sir Johnny Scott said Camilla Parker Bells was the sexiest girl any of us had ever met. But then along came Lowell. So she's been embedded in it. She's been back there in the 70s when Charles was still... Bouncing around the countryside with Camilla. Yeah. She was there. Well, says it all. Last comment from Bastion Radio, and uh, we'll be at the end of the news today. Yeah, no surprise with the Goddard thing as well, um, guys. You know, uh, how how anyone in their right mind could sit there and just take on board that she didn't know or doesn't understand the term establishment is just um, unbelievable to me. Um, I, I, we could, we could be all day talking about the CSA inquiry. It's been steered. It's been steered purposely, and it's been steered in a direction that has caused, again, divide um, within the CSA victims. This is what they wanted to do. And by bringing in Goddard, um, hoping that the UK nation will not you know, know anything about her, um, they can just slip her in nicely. And, um, you know, she can try and bluff us by saying that she doesn't know what the establishment is. Um, because she knows deep down she has got connections to the establishment. And as for having no establishment in New Zealand, poppycock. OK. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, that brings us to the end of uh, our news today. As I said, tom tomorrow Mike Robinson will be joining me and we'll be looking into the budget in some detail. Uh, what's the situation of Britain today? Well, utter corruption. And of course, we can't protect our children unless we stand up to be counted, that is. Ben Fellows, Old Bailey tomorrow, Chris Bivy, South End Magistrates, anyone who's near those locations, if you can go and show a bit of support, I know both gentlemen will be really appreciated, appreciative of that. Some um, support. Some support, exactly. And just a, a final thank you to the, um, uh, to the persons from the BBC who've been kind enough to give us some information over the last few weeks. It is much appreciated. And of course, if you have any more, we'd like to receive it. And then I believe that we uh, are having a blackout tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, it's also known as an eclipse. I think it should be starting around it's, quarter past eight. No, it's Sorry? about half past eight, I do believe. And I think it's going to hit us here around 9.30. I know definitely London's 9.30. Right. So, but apparently there's now there's more European smog, something that could hamper it. But okay. Probably but, even just more chemtrail spraying do you expect it tomorrow? Well, no, I, I believe that this eclipse is, is actually tied in with global warming. Uh, this is one of the things that we could have expected as the temperature increased. The squirrels. That, so possibly the squirrels. We leave it there before it gets out of hand. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.